Today, we recognize that no woman deserves to have her life ruined by a vindictive cyber sexual harassment assault. We live in a rapidly changing world. We need to recognize that vindictive people are not only tormenting others through harassing phone calls and stalking, but now they're releasing privately shared explicit, sexually explicit pictures and videos onto websites specifically designed for vengeful humiliation. As we all spend more and more time wired to the internet so, and other types of social media, we need to stay two steps ahead of anyone looking to maliciously expose someone's private life on the internet in a way that destroys reputations and puts emotional and psychological stability at je in jeopardy forever. That's what this law does. There are websites that are created out there for the sole purpose of exposing and humiliating individuals by posting their intimate images without the victim's consent. In a study, McAfee Security found that these sites have charged victims from hundreds to thousands of dollars to remove images and to try and right their reputation. And these are non-consensual pornographic pictures. In the first place, they should never have been there. Once this information is out there, just like with cyberbullying, once the information is out there, it is not coming back. That McAfee uh, security survey also found that 50% of the respondents had shared intimate photographs of themselves with a loved one or a friend, and that one in 10 people have had an ex threaten to expose these photos on the internet. Of those threats, 60% have been carried out. This is a lot of statistics, but the fact of the matter is, is that what this means is that one, there's a one in 20 chance that your daughter is going to find her images on the internet without her consent. You know, revenge porn is a sort of a treacherous form of online harassment. Um, and according to the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, surveying at least 1,200 victims have written to the group. Um, and in 80% of cases, individuals have shared, you know, it's in the, in the course of a confidential relationship. We have, we assume sort of communicative privacy, right? We experiment. Um, and individuals consensually share photos of themselves and let other people take photos of themselves on the assumption that it'll be kept confidential, right? Um, and so, you know, what happens is once that there's been this breach of confidentiality and photos are posted online, it's often, in 80% of cases, it's not just the photo, right, but it's alongside the victim's home address, work address, um, and other identifying information, including like snapshots of their Facebook profile, right? And so what that does, right, is raise the risk of physical attack for victims once strangers see, and it's often next to the suggestion that they're sexually available, so it increases the risk of physical attack. Um, it is emotionally devastating for victims, um, it's also a huge blow for someone's career, right? So when the first page of a Google search of someone's name is strewn with photos, you know, one's naked photos, their home address, and the suggestion that they're interested in sex, right? Folks have lost their jobs. It also prevents people from getting jobs, right? Um, in according to a recent study, um, over 80% of all employers engage in Google searches, right, to research candidates. In 70% of all cases, there's a negative result. And often the response, and this is a Microsoft study, is because of inadvisable photos, right? And so it's not that clients or companies think that individuals are responsible for putting up posts about themselves. It's that it's just not worth for them the reputational cost of having someone that works with them be associate, associated with this kind of material. It's just safer, frankly, to hire someone who doesn't have this kind of content online. Um, we've got to get at the source, right, the perpetrators. Um, so this statute is effective, I think, for two central reasons. It is specifically drafted it doesn't suffer from vagueness problems, which is one sort of a big problem we grapple with in the First Amendment. For criminal statutes, we have to make clear that perpetrators understand what it is they may face, right? That individuals know and have notice. 
it also is clear that it excludes images that concern matters of public importance, right? And so often when, when advocates are asked about these revenge porn statutes, the concern is, well, what about the Anthony Weiner incident, right? So there's, let's say, a congressperson or, or a, someone running for mayor who has made sort of the poor choice to share their sexually explicit photos with a stranger, which has happened in the first Anthony Weiner incident, right? And so because the bill explicitly excludes matters of public importance, the media certainly isn't going to be facing criminal charges should they publicize the actual photos of a congressperson, right? We have the right to talk about whether someone has poor judgment if they're running for office. When I was a target of revenge porn, the anguish I felt over being betrayed, exposed, <clears throat> excuse me, and put in danger, was multiplied every time I was told, there's nothing we can do. No crime has been committed. I decided to become an advocate and an activist when a state trooper who worked my case explained the limits of the Maryland laws to me. I was frustrated and blurted out, well, then I'm going to change the laws. His reply was, Anne Marie, if you can do that, it would make my job a lot easier. So I set out to keep my word to the trooper who was so kind to me in the midst of my ordeal and wanted to, as he put it, nail this guy to the wall for what he did to me. He was the first law enforcement official I encountered who showed genuine compassion, and I credit that as much to his character as I do to his understanding of the laws and the law's limits. There's no reason why victims of revenge porn should have their suffering exasperated by inadequate legislation that does not allow the local and state law enforcement officials to do their jobs well, to protect and serve. This legislation simply does not criminalize hurt feelings. It does not attack First Amendment rights. It is not a waste of the court's time. It is not an excuse for women who make stupid decisions. It is not just a bunch of feminine nonsense. It is the state's duty to see to it that their hired law enforcement officials are given the means to do their jobs. Enacting legislation that criminalizes non-consensual pornography keeps the promise of the state that its citizens will certainly be protected and served. Okay. Thank you very much.